So today we move on to the last uh, level of homicide, in this case negligent homicide. Uh, some jurisdictions throw this into the manslaughter category as a lesser form of manslaughter, but we're going to keep it separate. So we'll use the label negligent homicide to describe both in the common law and the model penal code uh, instances when a defendant causes the death of another uh, and the mens rea that's applicable is negligence, meaning they took a substantial and unjustified risk, which they should have been aware of, uh, and grossly deviated from the conduct of a reasonable person. Uh, as the slide indicates, and our case, a lot of these cases involve vehicles. Uh, instances when somebody is behind the wheel and is negligent as to their surroundings or uh, other cars or pedestrians, and that results in a death. Um, and so this is a common feature of these. Uh, it's fair to say a, a decent number of our recklessness cases also uh, fit uh, with, you know, our vehicle based. Um, in part because uh, when you add intoxication, particularly alcohol intoxication to the mix, uh, that it will be seen as elevating the negligent homicide to an involuntary manslaughter reckless homicide uh, because then uh, we presume that a person should not just have been aware of their substantial and unjustified risk but were in fact uh, um, consciously disregarding it uh, by uh, being intoxicated while uh, driving. Um, so the negligent homicide category is, you know, is really just the, the application of our generic MPC negligence rule uh, to a new specific act requirement pattern. So negligent homicide is not something that has its own specialized mens rea rules uh, like murder or like voluntary manslaughter. Um, with that being said, it's still worth including another case here, uh, and this case can both help with the concept of negligent homicide, but also in differentiating recklessness and negligence in general under the MPC. Um, and so, yeah, we're using this for both the common law and MPC for homicide, but it's also just a, a a reminder review of general lessons about negligence and recklessness under the MPC as well. Uh, so in Rollins, uh, we see you know, a fact pattern that's a little muddy. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of facts in this case uh, that we might wonder should have ever been brought before the jury. Um, and this is, uh, these facts are often critical to the differences between the dissent and the majority. The majority thinking that the jurors made proper inferences uh, from some of these facts, um, whereas the dissent points out that no, no, the, the uh, evidence of, say, intoxication, drug use here, um, it's largely irrelevant, if not um, completely so, uh, and perhaps shouldn't have been given to the jury at all. And so uh, what evidence do we have here against the defendant, right? He ultimately commits a manslaughter um, or, or is charged uh, with uh, the manslaughter, the head-on collision uh, with another car um, in uh, this context. Uh, but the, the crime uh, that we're looking at is the lesser included uh, offense of negligent homicide, right? So the difference between a uh, manslaughter and um, uh, neg and negligent homicide is just the mens rea. So although the jurors, or I mean, although the prosecution charged him with involuntary manslaughter, uh, he uh, was. Um, you know, appealing here all the way to the High Court of Arkansas, uh, whether or not this crime should have been um, merely negligence or not, um, or no crime at all, perhaps. Uh, but I think that ship had sailed. Um, and so because we have an intermediate appellate court here between the trial court, we actually see both sides arguing for a, a different outcome um, because the uh, intermediate court had um, uh, affirmed the convictions but modified the judgment just to include uh, negligent homicide. So that procedural stuff is all described in the first paragraph, but I just wanted to go over it again. Uh, so in this case, uh, what are the facts that indicate uh, um, either recklessness, negligence, or whatever the mens rea the defendant has? We know he was driving in a less than ideal fashion uh, in the time leading up to the accident because he was tailgating um, the Williamses. And, you know, that can indicate something. It's, it's not clear what, right? Because it's not contemporaneous with the actual accident, but it does seem to show some sort of erratic behavior, as uh, Barbara Williams described on the stands, saying, come way up to our bumper and then would back off. Um, 
you know, in truth, it's hard to know. I mean, if you've ever been tailgated or tailgated yourself, this is a, you know, not an activity that's automatically a sign that somebody is driving uh, in the way that, that ultimately followed here. At the time of the accident, uh, we have witness testimony that uh, the defendant was looking back over their shoulder, and so his attention seemed to be averted uh, from uh, the road, and that could be the explanation. Uh, when uh, the uh, you know he is at the scene and comes out of the car, there is a nurse there who uh, sees that he had uh, green pills underneath him, and she picked up three or four of them and later gave them to police. Um, we know that in his system, based on the the uh, forensic analysis, that he had some cocaine in his system. Uh, there's also pipes in the car that have cocaine residue. And um, the green pills were ultimately found to be hydrocodone and acetaminophen, which is an opiate. Um, and so, yeah, what does this all add up to? Well, you'll notice one thing that is missing uh, from uh, the prosecution's case is a driving while intoxicated charge. And I think this is why the dissent is, might be quite right about how this evidence was understood by the jury because it would seem strange to think that a defendant could be found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of manslaughter or negligent homicide based on drug consumption that wasn't sufficient to independently prove they were driving while intoxicated, right? Because, I mean, how would, how would it have impeded their behavior on, enough to cause the homicide but not to make them guilty of driving under intoxicated? And, uh, you know, the, the dissent, you know, points out that this is – you know, the, the way the case was handed procedurally below, the, the drugs shouldn't really be relevant here at all. This is the paragraph on page 282. The state further argued Rollins might have been impaired by the drugs, but admitted it did not know how that might affect you. Rollins' blood test showed that Rollins was not intoxicated, and the state chose not to put an expert to testify whether the cocaine in Rollins' blood could have impaired his driving. Normally, we wouldn't think of cocaine at at normal consumption qualities would impair driving. Uh, as the Court of Appeals concluded on the record, the issue of driving under the influence was a closed question. The state chose not to pursue that question. And so one of the difficulties here is, uh, what is all this, you know, the, the drug evidence has got to be entering the jurors' minds, and it does seem pretty prejudicial in terms of the outcome here. You know, the green pills that turn out to be opiates, the pipes that have um, residue uh, on them, the fact that there's cocaine in the system as well as a couple prescription drugs. It's easy for them to think um, that uh, this could have been impairing, but without the expert testimony, it should be irrelevant, right? Instead, we should be focusing on the conduct we do know about, which is his bad driving leading up to the accident, his uh, lack of attentiveness and turning away from um, the vehicle crossing the center line, and that might be uh, mere negligence, uh, whereas the majority says, no, no, we think there's enough for recklessness. So why this is actually in the negligent homicide section, even though the majority ultimately finds um, involuntary manslaughter was the proper uh, charge, is that this is a borderline case. I want to, I want to, you know, since we already have the basics at this point in the semester on NBC negligence and NBC recklessness, it's good to look at cases that, you know, are trying to test this border. And here, I, I think I probably would have agreed with the dissent, but there's, you know, arguments with the majority, particularly once the, the drug evidence is introduced, Allowing jurors, jurors to make inferences and then affirming those inferences is uh, normally a safe course uh, for a court to go. And so, uh, yeah, this is, um, you know, an instance that tries to show how an ordinary traffic exam gets colored by a lot of different facts. And when we're differentiating negligence and recklessness, which is only based on the defendant's conscious disregard for the substantial and unjustified risks that they're taking, uh, we're, you know, as the majority says, we're always in the world of inferring it indirectly. And jurors can sometimes look at some evidence and, and reach the conclusion of guilt or innocence, maybe for factors we, we ideally shouldn't have been included. But that's uh, the way the trial unfolded. And so we see a split decision here um, with arguments on both sides. Uh, so that's it for negligent homicide. Uh, next time, we'll be going into the felony murder rule.